The People vs. O.J. Simpson moves into the most complex part of the case, autopsy photos. How much is too much to show the jurors in order to convince them that Simpson is the killer? And is there a risk of upsetting the jurors so much that they turn away from critical evidence? I'm Roger Cossack, and this is OJ25. Counsel, is there anything we need to take up as to our change in focus here? I expect that the court will allow Dr. Lakshmanan to testify that he has reviewed all of the autopsy photographs and it would be helped by seeing all of the photographs that were available. Their intention is to demonstrate through these photographs something which they have no evidence of. And that is that the photographs can show premeditation and deliberation. The issue is, are these photographs helpful to a jury in assessing what was the state of mind of O.J. Simpson when he killed these two human beings? Now that the explanation or the argument regarding the relevance uh, has been made clear to the court, I'll overrule an objection as to that, although it is not a pleasant photograph. It's very, very difficult for Mr. Simpson. We would ask the court to give us a, a, some sort of an instruction to the jury, should Mr. Simpson have to leave the proceedings. I believe he probably can voluntarily absent himself. And one might argue whether this is a performance by Mr. Simpson, the actor, or truly a reflection of Mr. Simpson's alleged uh, grief for his uh, deceased wife. We indicated to you that there would come a time when we may have to show you some uh, photographs and some diagrams about uh, matters that are not pleasant uh, to look at. And uh, we apologize to you for that. If at any time during the presentation of this evidence you feel uh, unusually uncomfortable or if you need to take a break, uh, feel free to uh, let me know. The prosecution had to show the pictures. There was no question about it. It was the most brutal and horrible pictures that I've ever seen in my life. And if you're a prosecutor, there comes a time when you have to make a decision because these pictures are just awful. What should be the truth? How should be the truth? How should that? Yes. If we call you Dr. Lakshmanan, you will not be offended, will you? No, I will not. We call him Dr. Lucky. He was there when this occurred, but the main uh, pathologist involved was uh, Dr. Golden. Dr. Lucky is probably more articulate, and it's not a, a slam on Dr. Golden. Dr. Golden is a coroner's pathologist. He cuts up bodies for a living. He's not a PIO or a press information officer. As you sit here today, how do you feel about testifying in this case? Objection, Your Honor. You may answer. I'm here to present truthfully and accurately the coroner's findings so that the jury can understand the coroner's process and know the truth uh, about all the findings. What is your opinion to a reasonable medical certainty as to the cause of Nicole Brown Simpson's death? She died of multiple sharp force injuries. Do you have an opinion as to any source or sources that could cause that blunt force trauma contusion? Something like a fist. It could be an object with a round, smooth surface, like For a base of a knife. We took turns sitting next to OJ to shield his face, his response from the camera, because it was a very sensitive, difficult moment. You have the sharp force injuries to the left neck. You have sharp force injuries to the side and back of the head. Can you use me as Nicole Brown Simpson and indicate how, in your opinion, the uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and the perpetrator could have been face to face uh, in this manner? 
but all of those other injuries have been inflicted in a very short period of time. Yes. Nicole's head was actually grabbed by the hair, pulled back and sliced nearly to the spine. You could see the vertebrae through her neck, nearly decapitated. She had basically bled out. The photograph of the facial region of Ms. Simpson, and it depicts the fatal large uh, stab slash incised wound to the front of the neck. The only time that the jury or anybody else got to see Ron or Nicole was autopsy photographs. That's it. So you see somebody in death, you don't see them alive. We saw the autopsy photos. I can still close my eyes and see them. They were just so awful. And that was just uh, really hard to forget. My opinion is that Miss Brown was on the ground, face down, with this wound was inflicted. My opinion is that the head was extended backwards and the knife was used to cause this incised slash stab wound from the left to the right. This major wound to the neck is a final wound. As a lay term, she bled to death. Would that be accurate? That would be an accurate statement. If Mr. Goldman was uh, confronted by the uh, assailant in this confined area, he has no place to escape, especially if he's cornered between that railing and the tree and that sapling, he's, he's stuck there. Court TV's trial memos kept during each day's testimonies were often clinical analyses of legal strategies. Not on this day. The notes reflect the emotional impact the autopsy photos had, even on Court TV producers. The story of how Ronald Goldman fought ferociously for his life is told in pictures. The images tell a story of a man who struggled and wrestled and fought until his body crumpled to the ground. His defensive wounds evoke visuals of how he, at age 25, fought for his life and lost. One is a Y-shaped wound in the base of the thumb. The other is a cut in the web between the index and middle finger. This isn't a common robbery. This isn't a family dispute. Uh, this isn't an uh, argument with a neighbor. This is personal. The photograph shows the neck area and uh, facial area of Mr. Coleman. Uh, they look like controlled cuts on the front of the neck, which would indicate to me that Mr. Goldman was, at some point in the altercation, was immobilized in some manner like this and putting your knife in front of the neck and running the knife paddle, it would be like some kind of threatening cuts. Doctor, in this position, could that fatal stab wound number one have been inflicted on Mr. Goldman? Yes, it's possible. Though all of the photos are very sad and very gruesome, I would say that Nicole's are probably more gruesome. But for some reason, the jury really reacted strongly to seeing Ron's photos. Very, very strongly. People started crying. They needed to take a break. OJ's immediate response to that was to feel, was to express a feeling of extreme sadness and confusion as to why the jury hadn't have been as saddened or moved by Nicole's photos. I mean, he was very sad about that and perplexed about it. This has been a long day, and we're gonna take a recess at this time. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Shapiro. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, Dr. Lakshmanan. Good afternoon. Dr. Lakshmanan, you've been on the witness stand for approximately eight days. Yes, sir. 
Lon Cryer is juror number six in the Simpson trial. He takes detailed notes and keeps a personal journal, over 600 pages in all. Mr. Shapiro was very knowledgeable uh, in how he handled himself in the case. Uh, I always thought that he was trying to do the right thing himself. You would expect, as the person who is in charge of this medical office, that a doctor who performed the autopsy, who was not sick, not on vacation, not uh, doing other things that would prevent him from coming to court, would in fact be a witness, would you not? Argumentative and irrelevant. It's argumentative. Is that your practice, that uh, the doctor who does the autopsy, if available, testifies? On the date of June the 14th, 1994, did you perform an autopsy upon the body of an individual identified to you as Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes. Did you perform an autopsy upon the body of an individual identified to you as Ronald Goldman? Yes. A pathologist that did not do the autopsy actually described how the homicide occurred. I don't know why this was done. They're doing everything different. This is not the way you do things. Is it the practice of the coroner's office uh, that you supervise that the doctor who performs the autopsy, when otherwise available, testifies? That is correct. When you say it could have been or could be, you are speculating. I won't say it's speculation. You were not present when these murders took place. That is correct. There are no eyewitnesses to these murders. That is my understanding. You can not tell us within a reasonable degree of medical certainty what time they died. That is correct. In fact, all of your expertise lends you to the opinion that a layperson could give, that they were last seen alive at 9, that they were found dead at 12.15, and that is the range of death. Isn't that correct? Well, that's what I uh, opined also between 9 and 12.30. And with all of your training, experience, education, reading all these books, can you tell us with a reasonable degree of medical certainty how many people are responsible for these homicides? No. You're relying on the opinion of someone else who you have already told us has made several mistakes in this autopsy. Isn't that correct? Yes. It was a mistake in not documenting the injury. It was uh, found that the yellow sheet which they had, the second copy, the cannery copy, did not have the stomach contents mark. The envelope uh, uh, failed to uh, demonstrate that fingernail clippings had been, uh, fingernail scrapings had been collected. The bile specimen was saved, but the bottle label was marked as urine. Did any of the mistakes have any significance in your ability to determine the cause of death of Nicole Brown Simpson? No. Mother's Day, the year that my brother died, we talked as we always did, and my brother shared with me his plans to open up his restaurant. And after he was gone, we went to his apartment and we found all his plans of what he was going to be doing. He had a menu, he had um, plans, of physical plans of what the restaurant was gonna look like. No name, just a symbol on the door. The symbol was gonna be an Ankh, the Greek symbol for eternal life. <laughs> it's disturbing to think that that was the symbol. Mother's Day was the last time that I spoke to my brother. She was my sister and we had, it's not just losing a family member, like we had to share her murder with the entire world. Nicole was and is still in my heart a beach girl a little surfer, she was a mom. That woman was your quintessential homemaker, mom, hostess, entertainer. You could take Nicole to the White House one day 
and within two hours you can take her to McDonald's and be eating Big Mac and fries. <laughs> we had so many laughs and so many great times. demonstrate what you're talking about by just bringing the tip to the edge of my arm. Doctor, are you able to say that in fact only one knife caused all of the sharp force injuries to Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman? Yes. My opinion is that a single edge knife could have caused all the injuries. They never found the knife. Where's the knife? And nobody ever found a weapon. Murder weapon still not found. Where's the knife, Mr. Simpson? Can you tell us within a reasonable degree of medical certainty how many different weapons were used to accomplish these homicides? With reasonable medical certainty, I cannot exclude a second knife. I have a knife that has the uh, inscription Grand Chef Saboteur, another knife that's with a uh, brown wooden handle, and finally a knife that is, has a black handle. The purpose of these knives is to give the jury an understanding of the differences in class characteristics of knives. Is that correct? Yes. There is no representation made that any one of these knives is in any way connected to any of the injuries sustained by either Nicole Brown Simpson or Ronald Goldman. Is that correct? Yes. The knife box by the edge of the bathtub is more powerful evidence than having a bloody knife. Do you have an opinion as to the approximate minimum dimensions that any such knife would have? I can only give an approximate uh, estimation. A six inch long blade, single edge cutting blade with a blunt edge up to one eighth inch in width and about three fourth inch wide. You have to be able to say it was one knife. That was the big thing here. A knife wound can always be bigger than the knife is, but it can never be smaller. Wounds are important. The depth, the dimensions of the wounds are important if you ever recover a murder weapon. You want to know how thick the blade is. You want to know the depth. Uh, single blade, to uh, single edged or double edged. Is it serrated? Uh, is it really sharp? Either the victim moves when the knife is being penetrated, or the knife could be turning when the penetration is taking place, or when the knife is being penetrated, the victim pulls uh, uh, themselves away from the weapon. Can you demonstrate what you're talking about by just bringing the tip to the edge of my arm? I'm going to this. Oh, well, do you want to come over here and watch? No. Fine. Thank you. This is called twisting. Just try to escape from me. Like this, and you pull yourself away with the skin ripping open. I just wanted to demonstrate that the stabbing process, the cutting process, is not a fixed process. It's a dynamic process. Throughout the course of the trial, 10 jurors were dismissed. Poor Tracy. She was a nice girl. I recall the family was so distraught about her being there and all, and I, I believe her family was encouraging her to try to, to, to take herself out of the, the picture here. Seat number two, juror 1492. 
Farron's juror number was called, and then about five minutes after that, Willie's number was called. I especially noticed the hallway that we cross over through to get to the Judge Ito's courtroom was extremely full with more than the usual number of media types and spectators, which I imagined was in the expectation of something big happening. the other jurors seemed as though they were unfazed by the events that were unfolding around us today as most of the ladies continued their crocheting. Why am I so nervous is beyond me for her. I feel I have not engaged in any juror misconduct. Willie was very overbearing. Willie came off as if he had a, an agenda. With that, we're, we're down to 12 jurors and two alternates, and speeding hopelessly towards mistrial. Do you know, from your own personal knowledge, how and when that blood got on the sock? OJ-25 continues to unfold with one of the most difficult and challenging parts of the prosecution case, DNA testing. The prosecution tries to make it understandable. The defense claims that the results are unreliable and is relentless in attacking the evidence in every way possible. All right, back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, all parties are again present. Gregory Matheson, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y. Mr. Matheson, I'd like to ask you some questions about Mr. Simpson's reference blood sample. Would you agree that the suspect's reference sample in a criminal case is an extremely important piece of evidence? Yes, it is. I had asked him voluntarily to accompany me to Parker Center for an interview. He agreed to that. Did you take a sample of the defendant's blood that afternoon? He signed and agreed to give the blood sample. The nurse took a syringe from his equipment and drew a sample of blood. Blood samples of Mr. Simpson was transported from downtown back to Rockingham to be given to the criminalists. Could you use the analogy that all items of evidence are compared to that, correct? To that and other reference samples, yes. If the integrity of that reference sample is compromised in some fashion, then that would affect the validity of the analysis of other things that are compared to it. Would you agree with that? Oh, well. Yes, if there is uh, some problem that compromises the validity of it, then there is a concern, yes. So are you telling us that you took blood out of that vial to do work and made no entry anywhere of the withdrawal of that blood? The fact that blood was removed is implied by the fact that I did work on it and received results from it. I was there when the blood was drawn drawn by a medical professional. He drew the blood, put it in the standard vial, corked it, put a seal around it. Now, these seals they, they wrap blood in are hard as hell to get off. Now, before you took the cap off this, the tube from Mr. Simpson in this case, did you make any attempts to measure the amount of blood that was in that tube? No. From a scientific standpoint, what we're interested in is whether there's an, enough there for us to test. And it, that's, that's all I noted. And I, I note that by writing ample. That sealed vial of blood then goes into an analyzed evidence envelope. 
It's called chain of custody. It's a very common phrase that the defense should maybe read up on. No, they shouldn't. They knew better than this. The evidence showed that Van Adder had improperly taken the blood with him, and the circumstantial evidence very clearly showed that he had poured some blood from test tubes onto the sock. And so I was completely convinced that he had tampered with evidence. Shouldn't you be able to see blood if there was blood on there? It depends on uh, the color and the type of material it's on. Upon closer examination with different lighting, I was able to discern that there were some stained areas on the sock. All right, Mr. Matheson, thank you very much, sir. You are excused as a witness subject to being recalled. Prosecution calls Gary Sims. All right, Mr. Sims, would you come forward, please? As part of my examination of the uh, socks, the pair of socks, item number 13, a stain had been previously cut out. My understanding was that was by the LAPD. And so I took portions of those cutouts, of that cutout, extracted it, ran my tests, and then part of that extract of DNA in the tube, I sent to Cellmark for them to test. We had four labs involved in this case, four labs had every bit of the blood, they had the same blood. Every single one of those labs found the same results from the blood, exact same results. Did you have some sort of communication with Mr. Matheson about those socks that caused you to select the samples to test? I can't recall the exact date, but I was aware that he had obtained some conventional serology results that were consistent with Nicole Brown on that particular item. How do you sneak into the vault at the coroner's office and find Nicole's blood? Because that's where it was. That's where it came from. The coroner's responsible for that body. Her blood is at the vault, the crime scene. It went from the crime scene to the vault, the coroner's office. How do you do that, just that long? And then our vault at Piper Tech with all the security? What do you do in the middle of the night? I mean, this is a Mission Impossible, one of those movies. When I learned later that they claim there was the blood of victim and the blood of O.J. Simpson on the sock. The sock couldn't have been found in front of O.J.'s bed on a white rug because videographers had been there before the prosecution and others came. And you see the white rug and there is no black sock. This is absolute crap. And anybody with a quarter of a brain knows that. Which makes me wonder about Dershowitz sometimes. that those two samples are consistent from having come from the same source? Yes, they are. The two samples are Nicole Brown and the SOC 13A. Yes. Uh, Mr. Sims, as you sit here today, do you know from your own personal knowledge how and when that blood got on the SOC? No. We, we certainly aren't going to yell at your honor and become hysterical. Uh, we would, uh, I, I just point out... I that characterization. Okay. You know, well, that kind of personal attack is very improper and inappropriate. The following program contains graphic images. Viewer discretion is advised. Mr. Matheson, would you uh, please resume the witness stand, please? Is it your understanding that there is blood at the Bundy crime scene location that is consistent with Ronald Goldman, Nicole Brown, and the defendant? Yes. Can you think of, sir, any principle in natural sciences as to how the defendant's blood could contaminate the five Bundy drops, yet not the controls? Not given how the samples are processed and dried. The evidence that was there pointed to him. It, it was overwhelming. I know the DNA was newer back then, um, but when you see the statistics, it can only be him. I don't know how people can argue with science. I'm a science person. Does that mean that 
99.5% of the population can be excluded as having donated that sample. Approximately, yes. That was pretty new science at that point as opposed to the way it is today. DNA evidence is much more widely accepted and, and there's a greater expectation associated with it today in a courtroom. Then we had to spend a lot of time dealing with educating people about what DNA evidence was. You could take an entire series of college courses that would answer that question. So let me see if I can make a simple answer for you. DNA is, a, is correctly described as a polymer. That is, it's a long series of components that are all attached together. So we inherit one half of our DNA from our mother, and we inherit the other half of our DNA from our father. There were many, many long days of DNA evidence. Those were really, really hard days for, for the jury. You have written in as to the estimations of... The DNA evidence took about a month, and you're not going to convince jurors about the science of DNA. Between an approximately 1 and 170 million... Even those who did go to college are going... Ugh. And is that the same result again in terms of these estimates? Just tell me, just give me a number. Robin Cotton was one of the outside experts who gave these huge odds, like one in billions, that this could be anyone's blood but O.J. Simpson. Now let's move over to the next dot. Now this gets a little complicated. The defense strategy was to also make it seem more complicated. If that dot lights up, you could either have the 1.2 allele. Yes. You could have the 1.3 allele. Yes. Or you could have the 4 allele. It really seemed to work in conversations with the jurors afterwards. It really did seem like they didn't fully understand DNA evidence. If there's one part of this case I remember, it's the reporting of the DNA and being the legal analyst and trying to make DNA sound interesting. I think I was good at it for about maybe a day, day and a half, and then like everyone else, I was somehow blacked out into the ether. And it became clear that people were tuning out. Uh, I thought about that poor jury sitting there trying to listen, take notes, trying to figure it out. I remember the first day I had a yellow tablet. I was very, very, very in tuned. I was writing down the words. And about the third day, you could begin to see the scribbles going down the side of the page. They would have been much better off trying to simplify it and present it in a way that was more understandable to the jury. Mr. Sims, did the Department of Justice perform DNA analysis on the Bronco? Yes. What result did you obtain? The type was 1.1 comma 1.2. Okay, and is that result consistent with the known type of Mr. Simpson, the defendant in this case? Yes, it is. It was like going to school when you really didn't want to go to school. Imagine being in school on the hottest day of the year, but that hottest day lasts for a month. That was the DNA case in this, in this trial, and it was just awful. People were falling asleep. They, it was really difficult just to stay awake during it. I don't say that disrespectfully because it's an important case, but wow, it was hard to follow. As a forensic scientist, it is important to preserve the, import, the integrity of biological evidence, whether it is found in an automobile or on a street. Yes. And it is a good practice, uh, withdrawn, is it a good practice to permit individuals into an automobile for close to, for over two months before swatching the inside of an area for biological materials? Sustain. I'm starting to realize how much the Bronco really meant as far as for whether they found blood or not in it. There was always some problems as far as for certain blood samples from that vehicle uh, not being removed from the vehicle till weeks after it had went into the impound. Do you agree that chain of custody principles uh, apply to cars and their interiors just like any other piece of evidence? Yes. The whole point is, how was it collected? Did it how was it tested? Did it match? And the allegation was that detectives Lang and Van Adder somehow collected blood evidence at the house and contaminated it with blood at the crime scene so that there would be a match. This data that you've been reporting to us could be consistent with blood from Mr. Simpson 
being smeared on that console first, and then some other person or person subsequently entering the car and contributing biological material to the stains on the console. It would have to be a significant contribution and it would have to be a very consistent contribution across the console. I remember very clearly when we would have defense team meetings and our person would tell us, here are the latest DNA results. And it would be, it's a mixture of OJ and Nicole and Ron Goldman. And I mean, that would sound absolutely terrible. Like this is the worst thing ever. Obviously, he must have done this because what else could this mean? Except <laughs> you can't trust the message if you can't trust the messenger. And as we're going through it and we're seeing all of these missteps and protocol not followed and compromised evidence and cross-contamination, and I mean, there were all sorts of things like that. So what initially the prosecution thought was a slam dunk because of all of this evidence really didn't turn out to be that way. You did not find the kind of bacterial degradation that you found on those Bundy drops, did you? The following program contains graphic images. Viewer discretion is advised. Mr. Matheson, with respect to item number 54 uh, for identification, which is in the area of the gate, would you expect that to have been subject to the same uh, environmental conditions as the blood under the fingernails and on the pool? The DNA evidence was wonderful. When you understand it, it, uh, it really allows you to, and if you trust it, really allows you to hone in on you know, who the, who the, uh, where the source of that evidence is. What frequency estimate did you produce for the eight probe match on 117 to Mr. Simpson's uh, known reference sample? These results are the same as what we obtained from the SOC, namely, uh, one in 57 billion African Americans, one in 150 billion Caucasians, and one in 100 billion Hispanics. We've just presented evidence that proved the defendant's blood to be uh, of such a rare type that it's one in 57 billion. 59 you, billion was 50, it? I thought it was 50, 57. It was 2 billion. It was 2 billion, yeah. give or take. When you realize there's only 9 billion people on the planet. It appears that that sample is up on the gate. It's going to be subjected to the same general environmental as far as weather conditions and such. Hypothetically, Mr. Matheson, if blood from this case, from an evidence item such as from the back gate, showed the presence of a chemical, EDTA, would you agree that that is consistent with it possibly coming from a reference file. If it was present in it, if it was able to be identified in it, it is possible that it could have come from some type of reference sample that previously contained EDTA. Do you recall answering a question on cross-examination, a hypothetical question involving if there were EDTA on the socks and the rear gate, what effect that that would have? Yes, I believe so. Do you know what the basis for that hypothetical was? Objection. No foundation. Any others? <laughs> Sustained. I agree that it would have been appropriate to have sustained the objections to the questions that I asked. But I also believe that the objections to the questions that they asked exactly along this line where they stated that there was no EDTA and if there was no EDTA, would that indicate that it came from the blood vial and the witness answered yes, should have been sustained and they weren't. Mr. Goldberg had just acknowledged that he asked questions that he knew was improper and every time he does it, he turns to face the jury and you can tell from the first three words of the question that they're improper, he knows they're improper, he's experienced enough to know that and we object to that. 
the hypotheticals we asked, he objected to. You sustain, or you overruled the objections. We're allowed to ask the hypotheticals. You sustained all these questions. He continues to ask them. We would ask that some appropriate sanction be imposed. Mr. Goldberg, any response? I'm concerned. Honor, I'm concerned about your admission that you knew that those questions were improper. Your Honor, wait a minute. I have always tried to be very candid with the court. It would be intellectually dishonest for me to say that giving a hypothetical to a witness of facts related to testing that he doesn't know of would be a proper hypothetical question. But the court also knows that I have disagreed about a lot of the hypothetical questions that have been given by the defense and by both sides. About the only EDTA question that appears to be proper in this line of questioning is how much is the standard amount of EDTA in one of these vacutainers and how much would that add to the blood volume in this case, but apparently nobody, nobody wants to ask the only obvious question that this jury is interested in hearing. The only testing done on the rear gate for the presence of EDTA was done by the prosecution at the prosecution's request. The FBI report reads, no EDTA was identified the stuff wasn't contaminated any more than any blood would normally be contaminated under these circumstances. You did typing of sample 117 from the back gate. Yes. You were shown pictures of that on direct examination. Yes, I believe I was. That's the gate. The rear gate, yes. Rear gate. Rust on that rear gate. Well, I'd, I don't recall seeing rust that clearly, but... I'd have to see the photo again. I just, I looked at it mainly for the location. That was mm -hmm. the main thing in my mind. And when you examined through your quantitative methods, the quality of the DNA from 117, you did not find the kind of bacterial degradation that you found on those Bundy drops, did you? No. They were able to poke so many great holes into the, uh, the blood evidence as far as for the gathering, transporting, and the analysis themselves of the samples. I don't know if you're watching the jury at all, but they're rolling their eyes every time we get to the fifth or sixth question that's been re-asked and asked again. The prosecution is almost done, but as they approach the end of their case, there's a very real question. Have they convinced the jury that O.J. Simpson is the killer? Coming up, a gamble by one of the prosecutors backfires in one of the most iconic moments in this or any trial in American history. Your Honor, at this time, the people would ask that Mr. Simpson step forward and try on the uh, glove recovered at Bundy as well as the glove recovered at Rockingham. That's next on OJ25. I'm Roger Kosek. <laughs>